welcome to Living Transplant, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of the transplant program at Toronto General Hospital and brings you open and honest conversations about the transplant experience. My name is Candice, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Centre for Living Organ Donation. I'm also a kidney transplant recipient. This is where I developed my passion to support others in their journey to navigate the world of transplant. Full disclosure, I'm not a physician, and I'm not here to give you medical advice. Think of me as your guide through the world of transplant to educate, inspire, pique your curiosity, and fuel your passion. Living Transplant will show you the world of transplant like you've never seen it before. Welcome to Living Transplant Season 3. Today is a topic that is incredibly close to my heart. We are going to be discussing pregnancy and kidney disease. I was diagnosed with kidney disease without having any knowledge that I had kidney disease. I ended up doing peritoneal dialysis at home. And during that time, they spoke about transplant. And my mom stepped up and was the first one tested. And we are incredibly lucky that she was my donor. And 13 years later, we are both doing incredible. During that time in hospital, however, I was very bluntly told by a nephrologist that at the age of 24, I would never have children. So that was never part of my idea of what life could be until I attended a conference and one of the speakers was speaking about pregnancy. And she had someone there who was on dialysis and she had a healthy baby on dialysis and there was another woman who was transplanted and she had also had a healthy baby and I thought to myself what is happening here like this is actually a possibility so I went back and did as much research online as I could find and I was able to meet with Dr. Anna Matthews who we're going to talk to later today So I am incredibly grateful and happy to say that in February of 2021, we welcomed a little girl, Clementine, and she is the absolute light and joy of our lives. And so talking about this topic today brings me so much joy, and I'm so excited to have my guest host, Kate, today join me, who is a good friend and superwoman. Uh, Kate, welcome, and thank you for being my co-host today. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So today we're going to interview Dr. Anna Matthew, who is a nephrologist at St. Joe's Healthcare in Hamilton. But before we speak to Dr. Matthew, Kate, I would love to have you share a little bit about your connection to transplant and to our topic today. Awesome. Thanks, Candice, again. Appreciate you so much for having me and being your guest host today. Very special honor. So my kidney journey started just a few years after yours, Candice. And in 2011, I was suddenly diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease. Also, I was only in my mid-20s, ended up Mm -hmm. in hospital with extremely high blood pressure and my function was very low at the time. So thankfully, I was able to stabilize with good life changes. Not that I lived a bad lifestyle, but it was just when your health isn't 100%, you have to make sure that you take care of yourself. And I was able to stabilize, thankfully, along with some medication. And I avoided dialysis, which as the word thankful, and that is an understatement when it comes to that. And I got another six years actually with my native kidneys, which I'm very thankful for. But I would say it was probably 2017, it became very clear <laughs> that my function was starting to decline and that the idea of a kidney transplant was most definitely needed. So this conversation had happened before back in 2011. So it wasn't a new conversation, but of course, a lot had happened in that time in my life. And so I was thankful. There were so many people that got tested to be a possible donor, but who knew the man I had just married, not even a year before actually only four or five months before would be my kidney match. And that's what you call a match made in heaven, right? (laughs) Just adds another level. (laughs) People always ask me if I knew he was a match before we got married. And I was like, well, we knew we were compatible blood types, but we didn't know that he would actually be a match. It was such a beautiful gift and willingness for him to not only support me in that day in day out of living with the disease, but also then giving a piece of himself. And, And we always joke that I have a little piece of him with me at all times now. So I'm never alone. (laughs) 
That's amazing. In September of 2017, we had a very successful kidney transplant surgery. And again, our recovery, little things here and there with any kind of major surgery, but really it was overall very successful. And what the conversation about starting a family, I would say started again, because we definitely had that conversation earlier in our relationship and had hoped to maybe start a family earlier, but health took priority at that time. But it was very exciting to know that my medical team was behind me so that we could start that conversation again about having a family. Amazing. When you did decide that was going to be part of your future and you wanted to become parents, how did your kidney disease or the transplant impact your conception? Did that factor into anything? Yeah, when the discussion originally we had hoped maybe to have prior to transplant to start a family and that's one of the reasons probably my function started to decline in general was I had some medication changes that didn't go to plan and my body just wasn't able to so that's Mm. when that was shelved as I like to say at the time and it was focused on health following in my case quite commonly within post transplant you have to wait at least a year afterwards really to make sure you're stable your medications working because there are some meds that you can and can't be on when pregnant. And it took us a little while to get pregnant the first time around. And we had actually just inquired to maybe be referred to fertility because we thought maybe we needed some assistance in that side of things. And then very fortunately, we were able to get pregnant. It was a bit of a surprise and it wasn't, I guess, a right. surprise. A but planned surprise. It, the least likely time we thought it would happen, it did. And yeah, we were pregnant with our first child. Amazing. That happened to my husband and I as well when we decided that we were going to start planning for potentially having a child. Our team told us don't get too tied to a timeline. We're not sure how this is going to go. You're healthy and your kidney looks great. But just like any other couple in the world, we don't know if you will conceive quickly or it'll take you a long time. So we had planned to give ourselves a year or so. And for us, the opposite happened. So within about two months of us trying, we were on vacation and my husband said, I think you're really late. Like, I wonder if you're already pregnant. And I was like, oh, we're at the cottage. Like, let's not worry about it. It's nothing. I'm sure I'll be fine. And then we got home from the cottage and ended up buying three pregnancy tests. And he actually also bought a bottle of champagne in case we were pregnant. And I said to my husband, I can't drink that. It's I'm actually pregnant. And he was like, oh, right. Okay. Well, I guess if we're pregnant, then I'll celebrate with the champagne and you can have a ginger ale. So we were very shocked. Like you said, though, it was like a planned surprise. And I'm sure that's how everybody feels, right? That even though you're hoping and planning, once it does happen, it's so surprising and exciting that it does does happen. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's such yeah, a special moment for those that go that through the experience. And it's just and it's special for everyone. When you've been through such a journey with your health for so long. There's a lot of excitement and nervousness because there's this little miracle literally growing inside of you. And just like everybody, there's lots of things to keep an eye open. And then when you're post-transplant, it's a whole Mm -hmm. other ballgame. But thankfully, as we'll talk about, there's an amazing support system of the medical system to help those going through the process. You don't go into these decisions lightly when you know had a major health piece in your life and having everyone behind you to support you is such an important piece of the journey for sure. You found out you were pregnant with Addie and how did that go? How was the pregnancy and did you have any issues with any complications throughout that time? Yeah, definitely those first handful of weeks, again, no different than a regular pregnancy in the sense Mm -hmm. that there's just that nervousness is this little one going to stick and that sort of thing. We made it through the first month, two months, three months. And I would say the, the overall process that first time around was absolutely a bit, well, it's all new, (laughs) Yeah, but other than I would say some additional tests, Mm -hmm. blood work and ultrasound and seeing maybe a few other specialists. Again, I had nothing to compare it to. So to me, it seemed regular compared to many friends or family that have had kids. There was definitely a few extra pieces that were put in for monitoring purposes throughout the process. Overall, I would say I had a full term pregnancy, but I didn't. (laughs) 
quite common with transplant recipients or those living with low kidney function or on dialysis, you plan accordingly that you are likely to have a child a bit earlier. And I'm a planner. I like to have things <laughs> and not knowing exactly what was going to happen, but then knowing that the likelihood to plan accordingly that this little munchkin would arrive earlier in, in our life was that. And we were fortunate with our daughter, Adeline or Addie, as we love to call her, that she did arrive a full month early, but you would never know it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, she came out still seven pounds, 2.6 ounces. Wow. She was a big girl, even at a month early. I guess I'm thankful, I guess in some way, I didn't have to birth a full, <laughs> maybe nine yeah. months old child. And she only had a handful of hours really in the NICU just to monitor her sugars. And she did have to have some of the ultraviolet light mm-hmm. done a couple of days for her bilirubin. But Overall, you would never know that little one was the full month early. And we're so thankful that process went so smoothly. Yeah, she's a healthy, now just turned two year old. (laughs) Incredible. And like you, my little one Clementine was also a month early. So she was born 36 weeks. She was almost three pounds smaller than yours. She was a tiny one. She was 4'10". But like Addie, she spent actually only maybe 15 minutes under the lights. Didn't need any time in the NICU. She was ready to go. So in recovery, she breastfed within 15 or so minutes of us being in recovery. And I think she was just kind of ready for this world. And we had such an amazing team, like you were saying too, who monitored us and made sure that everything was going well throughout the pregnancy. And the reason why she came early was because I ended up having preeclampsia at the end of the pregnancy, which is also very common among us kidney transplant patients. And like you said, premature babies are also very common, but we were very grateful that we had such a great team. And I did have a lot more ultrasounds than friends who do not have kidney disease, but I was really grateful for that because I got to see her so much more often. (laughs) I totally agree. (laughs) Yeah. There are some silver linings to being a high risk pregnancy that you do get to see your wee one more often and you have way more ultrasound photos of them. It's amazing to hear how well that went. And uh, I'll break the news. You are no secret over here. (laughs) You're pregnant with your second, which is incredible. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we decided to go for it again, as we say. And and now having a two year old, they're like, what were we thinking? No, we're so excited. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah, we're expecting I hope to have about another four or five weeks with this little munchkin. We know that we're having a little boy. And mm. yeah, we're super excited. And yeah, we're hoping again, planning accordingly that likely he is to arrive a little early. And same things like you just said, monitoring things like preeclampsia. I'm in that kind of I call it my other full time job, which is blood work and obstetricians and other thankfully, some of them virtual virtual appointments, Mm -hmm. and then a couple extra ultrasounds. Not very often do people after 20 weeks have ultrasounds unless needed. And whereas I've already had another one at about 29 weeks pregnant, and I'll have one here at 35 weeks coming up in a few weeks here. The big thing, and this time around, a little different than with Addie, he is still, well, actually no different than Addie. He's measuring big as well. I just seem to grow big babies, I guess. Um, But last time I saw him, he is what's called breech. So meaning his head's up, his feet are down. They're definitely keeping an eye on that because I was fortunate with my daughter to be able to deliver her. I say naturally, now it was an induced, like an induction delivery, but I was able to birth her. Whereas if he stays breech, unfortunately, it wouldn't be safe to go. And so C-section would be needed, which as I keep saying to people, honestly, whatever is the safest for him and I, that is all that matters at this point. And I've already had one major big surgery. I'm sure other than I will now have a baby and a toddler to chase around, but whatever safest is what's most important. So yeah, we're having another one. (laughs) Amazing. And that, that was my journey. I ended up having a planned I'm going to say planned, unplanned C-section with Clementine because it was planned for day of the week. And then I went in because at this time it was COVID. We were during the pandemic. So there was a lot of extra screening. I had to get in to to get my COVID tests and get all of that stuff done before the C-section was planned. And when I went in, They said, we're not liking your blood work. We are going to monitor your blood pressure. We'll take your COVID tests and do all of the prep, but we're just going to keep you here a little bit longer. 
And then a couple hours later, they came back and said, is there any way you could call your husband? Because I think we're going to take her tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And I was like, well, no, we have an extra day, right? We're supposed to have an extra day. This is why planning it is so great because we know the exact day and we have our bag ready and we have all of this ready. And we thought we had an extra day. And they were like, sorry, honey, get your husband here. We had a planned, unplanned C-section. And for me, the thing that I just kept saying was, please don't cut my kidney. Please don't touch the kidney because I just thought our kidneys in the front and I knew there was going to be an incision there. And they laughed at me and said, don't worry. We don't go anywhere near there. It's a very different incision than your kidney. It's actually like perpendicular. So it's a different way of the cut even, and the incision is different. So Now I always laugh because I went to a pelvic floor specialist and asked her for some support and some exercises to help me have ab strength. And she gave me a lot of exercises, but she said like, you won't be the same person you were before because you now have an incision one way and across the other. You're not going to have a lot of strength there. Not that I would have anyways with my (laughs) lifestyle. I don't have a six pack anyways, right? (laughs) But it was definitely for me a fear. Like, will you go anywhere near the kidney or will you affect that kidney in any way? And I think there was about 25 people in the delivery room all saying, it's okay. We're here to watch your kidney and we're here to watch the baby and we're here to do both. And so it's remarkable the audience that you have when you have a baby with a kidney transplant, I would say. Yeah. And that's very interesting. Yeah. Of course, not going through the C-section with the first one, it may be a whole different experience this upcoming time if we have to move forward with C-section. So it'll be very intriguing. There was with the delivery still, there seemed to be a lot of people in the room, to be honest, I wasn't really paying attention at the time. What was, who was (laughs) around me other than my husband and the poor, I'm sure his hand was half broken. All of a sudden you stop to realize and yeah I all of a sudden like there's a pocket of people here and I'm just like oh okay well if there's any dignity left it's all gone out of the room now. absolutely <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always say that too you think you you think it's all gone after the kidney transplant then you add a baby on top of that and now you don't care who's in what room right <laughs> no not at all and again Thankfully, my delivery was, it wasn't overly enjoyable, but that's just a part uh, of the journey. And that's, but she was healthy. She was okay. Mm-hmm. I was generally okay afterwards too. Definitely that it, it's a lot to go through both surgery yeah. wise, as well as delivery wise. And definitely had, they had to watch my hemoglobin there for a few days, but thankfully didn't mm-hmm. need a blood transfusion, those sorts of things. Cause that adds into pieces around future kidney transplants and having infusions and babies and things, which sure. I know we'll, we'll kind of get into at, at a certain point, but yeah, it's all those things, the recovery piece. But once that initial handful of hours after delivery, my recovery was actually quite simple and in the end. So I'm very thankful for that and a healthy baby. That's all that mattered. (laughs) That's all that matters. So has this pregnancy been any different than your first? Yeah, it probably wasn't until after 20 weeks and likely a good portion I'm going to guess is because of his positioning, his feet down, head up. I think that is playing a bit of a difference. As I joke, I am chasing a two-year-old around now too. That's an added piece that wasn't there last time too. But yeah, there's definitely a few. The process itself, the appointments and things are very similar as it was last time. But again, in that go time right now of monitoring things like preeclampsia and the protein in the urine and, and things like that, just to keep really on top of things. But yeah, my body's definitely a bit more tired. I'd say this time and a little bit slower, but again, it's as with any person that goes through a pregnancy, it's a miracle to watch what the body can do and the positive parts of pregnancy and the not so positive parts. There's some glamorous and non glamorous right. things. Yeah, absolutely. For you and your husband, was there as yeah. any hesitation to decide to have a second or were you guys excited that this could be a possibility or both, I guess, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, I think you never want to take for granted that our first experience going through pregnancy was pretty flawless. We were very optimistic. And honestly, I think Adeline wasn't even quite three months and I had a follow up with one of my specialists and he just said, okay, from a medical perspective, what do you think the likelihood of us being able to do this again? And she's like, wow, you're really on it. I'm like, well, we're not there yet. Don't get me wrong. (laughs) But I want to have that conversation from the medical side point. Would it be 
optimistic for us to think that we could do this again. And they were very positive right off the bat that yes, a second pregnancy would likely be totally doable. And then for my husband and I, it was just more of a timing thing. Like when did we want to? And both of us, my husband's about five years older than me. And so like, I'm in my late thirties now and timing and age kind of played into it a little bit. Um, We didn't want to wait too long in between. Now compared to trying to get pregnant with Adeline, this little guy did not take as long to ever ask to get pregnant with just similar to yourself only kind of a couple months in and mm-hmm. and it was a very a very kind of stressful and, and special time in our family as unfortunately my husband's father was not doing well at the time that we found out though that we were pregnant so that brought a little bit of joy <laughs> to mm-hmm. the family and that sort of thing and we know that his dad knows that we're having a kid and all that kind of stuff so it's pretty special in that way for sure that's amazing yeah. And so talking about family, my mom has always wanted to be a grandmother. I feel like when she became a mom, she was like, all right, I'm ready to be a, come a grandmother whenever these kids are grown up and ready to do this. So she's waited a long time. But there was some hesitation from her in thinking about my health. And she was worried about what would that would do to my kidney because we've had such a great experience with the kidney transplant. I haven't had any scares, no issues. I've been able to do so many things post-transplant and my husband and I have traveled a lot and I finished my degree. So there's been so many of these beautiful milestones that we've been able to celebrate because of that transplant. So as much as she desperately wanted to be a grandmother, she also had that fear of what would that do to my health? So did you have any of that from your family. Yeah. And that's, and I can totally appreciate, especially uh, a mother giving that second chance at life to her daughter. And uh, yeah, that, that struggle of wanting and uh, yes. at the same time wanting to protect what she gave and all that kind yeah. of stuff. I would say from our family's perspective, they knew from well before we had transplant that family was the number one, as was our medical team. Like everyone right. was, we made our wishes clear of what our goal was. And we were mm-hmm. hopeful that things would go as planned. And so from family perspective, no, we had full support. Of course, I'm sure my husband wanted to make sure that his kidney would stay healthy and mm. knock on wood. Thankfully, actually, my function after having Adeline, my one nephrologist showed me that actually my function has been a little bit higher since having her, yeah. um, which is crazy, right? To think that having a child actually increased in the end, that doesn't always happen. But uh, thankfully, our families were very supportive from the beginning. As I say, my husband's gift is what's allowed us to have these beautiful little gifts that we're having when our kids will fully know how special and extra special they are because they are here because of their dad, really. (laughs) That's amazing. I think for us, that was one of my husband's biggest fears is we've had so many years of health and he was worried that what if that put my health at risk? And that was a big conversation that we had to have together that were we willing to go through this process and trust that our medical teams were there to protect us and advise us all the way through this and keep us really safe and keep the baby safe. And like yourself, I was blown away when I heard that my creatinine was some of the best that it's ever been since the transplant when I was pregnant post. And I always look at my numbers and I'm blown away by how well my kidney's doing post. So that's an extra little gift I guess I got from Clementine and from my mom too, right? Together, they're making me function even better. <laughs> But yeah, exactly. that's, it's amazing to, to know that your husband was able to not only give you a new life, but then also create two new lives with you. That's such a unique, incredibly magical thing that you have Absolutely. for your family. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I can never be more thankful for it. And you bring up a very good point around the future and what that holds. Mm-hmm. And those are things that you always have to keep in mind and you don't go into these decisions lightly because you have to look at having to small children who will then grow up into teens and then to adults, you have to look at the long term of single parenting is not an easy task for you and I, we have probably little snippets of time where it's just us and the child and you just you give all props to single parents. You mm-hmm. need to keep in mind the health and well being of both parents and that sort of thing. I never take for granted that my kidney function is doing well and I hope that it will for many years. You had a number of years more since transplant mm-hmm. before we were only, well, let's see, we're coming at five years post transplant now this fall. And mm-hmm. so really it's only been, we were 
only kind of two, three years into our process post-transplant that we, we lived a lot of life in that small amount of time, but yeah, yeah. not as many years to reflect on that gift and the longevity because transplants aren't a forever solution. Amazing numbers out there that we see, right, with people. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that that my function stays with me for many more years and Mm -hmm. can continue to live our life as best as normally as possible with a few extra doctor appointments in there afterwards. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's one thing that I find I hear a lot from our community is just, we want to live our days as fully as we can, because we've gotten all of this extra time, I guess you would call it. And it's interesting because my brother always says that about Clementine. Like I always say that I get extra days because of my transplant. All of these days are extra time that I've been given. But my brother says that too. He's like, you got a preemie. So you get all these, you got a month of extra time with your Clementine too, which is really sweet. But you think about what's coming in the future and how long your transplant will last and what will happen if you need another one and we have children and how that will impact them. And I think all of the joy that surrounds thinking about having a baby and having these incredible little beings in our life, sometimes we also have to put on our practical hats and our logical hats and think about planning and making sure that we are taking the best steps forward to make sure that we're healthy enough to be around for them too. Absolutely. And I think those are the things that, you know, as I say, Adeline and her future little brother here will be very aware of the kidney world in general and kidney health and, you know, what happened to make them be here in this world. And when the time is right around, generally, most people that I know and meet, they have no idea that I've had a kidney transplant, right? right? It's very unknown. So of course, my child doesn't know either. And clearly my yeah. star hasn't, she's not quite at that curiosity of like, well, why do you have that line there? And I'm sure that will come up someday. And my husband and I are very very much a very open, we're going to be open with conversation around what that means and what that might mean in the future with not bogging them down because they're just, they're little and they're, they need to be kids and not have to worry about their parents. But there's just even little moments of like, oh, I bumped my foot and I'm like, oh, ow. And she comes over like, are you okay? They're very aware of when you aren't your normal self. So sure. I'm very conscious that will be something I'll have to keep an eye on for many years in, in, in the future as we go through this journey. And again, Mm -hmm. I hope I have many years. We'll take the strides as they come. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got to ask you, one of my favorite things to ask moms and also pregnant people too, is what's your favorite thing to do as a family together? I'd say there's two main things. We also have a dog in our life. So of course he plays a big part in our daily life. On weekends, usually on Saturday, Sunday mornings, you will find our little family out in the forest somewhere. That can be just a park within the city or sometimes out on a few of the trails. Maybe not as many big trails right now. I'm a slower hiker right now. I'm so fortunate I live on the West Coast and we have beautiful kind of forests and rainforests and that sort of thing. And so you would find us out enjoying wandering around paths, letting the dog just be free and running and that sort of thing. So that's definitely one of our things, but even small little things in life, like on Sunday nights, quite commonly, we'll have a little movie night and there we are all cozied up on the couch and showing her some of either our favorite movies from when we were younger or some of the new flashy ones that she's really into because they're bright and they're fun and they're moving dances around. It's just, you take those little moments as those are super special moments. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just, just spending time together, even on Father's Day, she went to her first kind of sporting event and we went to a baseball game and just one as a COVID baby because she was born also in the first few months of COVID. Big crowd stuff was not really happening. When we walked into, it's a smaller little stadium, but you walk in and her face just was just like, wow, like, look at all these people and what is happening and people are cheering and she's just like clapping like, yes, okay, woo. And she like, it's on her excited voice and and that sort of thing. (laughs) Now fast forward another hour and a half and she's, okay, I'm done with this. What are we doing? (laughs) Right. Those little or more about experiences, right? Instead of like buying things and things, we just like to go and do things. And those are the memories that we hope will last with them for a long time. And we know this little guy will be part of all of that too. That's incredible. So thinking about, you mentioned COVID, having her walk into that stadium thinking, oh my gosh, look at all these people. (laughs) I have that feeling often as myself too, Addie. (laughs) But 
but uh, we just went to a play last weekend and same thing. I, I had my mask on and I was looking around thinking like, wow, this is wild to be back in civilization again. Going through two pregnancies now, for us, I was pregnant in the summer after COVID had hit at the time when I did my dating ultrasound. And then the second ultrasound that I had, my husband was actually on FaceTime because they didn't allow people to come in. And thankfully, when I delivered, he was allowed to be there the whole time. And he stayed with me in the hospital. And it, that was all fine. And having my mom there wasn't an option. And that was always something that we assumed would happen with my mom would be part of the delivery with my husband too. So I know a lot of women struggled through being pregnant during COVID and managing not having that extended community that you're used to, like with baby groups or mom groups. How did you deal with that? For me, the first handful of months, of course, was prior to COVID. So we were mm -hmm. able to announce to our family friends in our group settings as we used to know prior to COVID. And then it it hit and both my husband and I were working from home and it was just us. And then everything yeah. became virtual, virtual baby showers, virtual. Right. We didn't do a tour of the, ho the hotel, <laughs> the hospital, sorry. Our prenatal classes were all online. Again, I had nothing to compare it to. So I think it would have been even more of a struggle if I'd had a child prior to COVID and then mm -hmm. during COVID. I like to think that I kind of flew with the flow of things of, for COVID. Forever grateful that, yeah, at the time, even though, so that started in March of 2020, she was born in June, 2020. We we're still in the first few months there. And thankfully my husband could be there with me because mm -hmm. I know there were places even in Canada that spouses yeah. for a while, they weren't even able to be in there. And that just... You need that, that at least your husband within the hospital, I do have to say it was a really, my parents don't live here locally, so they would have had to travel anyways. And, but there was something really special about those first few days, especially just being up and not having visitors at the hospital as, as nice as that would be. It also just allowed us to be with her and take care of ourselves. But once we got home and settled and thankfully it was summer then, so we could yes. at least be outside, but we do reflect at moments over these last two years that there's definitely things like the going to a sporting event or even just the connection she has with people, though she's a very social child, thankfully, and she now goes to daycare and all that kind of fun stuff. There are moments when she was little that family would come over for a visit and it would be, there would be some hesitation because she's just so sure. used to seeing mom and dad and not mm -hmm. the extended family. So I think there were some beautiful things that came out of COVID and a lot of challenging things. And I think mm -hmm. you mentioned groups and mom groups and stuff like that. And I feel fortunate that with in the world we live in today with social media and that sort of thing. And again, the timing of having a baby in the summer was mm -hmm. that at least there was a group of us that could still meet outside for walks and right. could socially distance. And so I feel fortunate at that point. If I had had a fall baby, I don't know, it might have been a bit more challenging just mm -hmm. because of being able to not really do as much stuff indoors. Though there was challenges. And I think we'll all see kind of those impacts for years to come with the kids that have been boring during this time. So far, we're, I think we're maneuvering okay with Adeline and she seems to be, there's moments you're, oh, right, yeah, you haven't really experienced this. Yeah. Help you maneuver this and it's okay. You can trust these people. I know you didn't see them as much as you might be, what if it hadn't been for COVID times, but yeah, keeping them safe. My daughter and I both did end up having COVID earlier this year. Thankfully, very minor. I was vaccinated to the most at that point. Of course she couldn't and she, you wouldn't even know when she had COVID, to be honest, it was less than some of her colds that she's had. So That's great. You know, we're thankful for that, but it definitely is things to keep in consideration when you have these little people who are coming into this world that is a different world now. Absolutely. I'm wondering if if you have anything you would like to add before we introduce Dr. Matthews, because I think she's probably going to be joining us in about two minutes. Hi, Dr. Matthew. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? It's nice to see you in person, virtually in person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is Kate. Uh, Hi, Kate. Kate is my co-host today. Kate has a two-year-old, Adeline. Okay. Uh, and then she's also currently pregnant with her second. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, on the last stretch, I'm 32 and a half weeks pregnant right now. Okay. Well, you know how it goes. <laughs> Hot though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in BC, so we're finally okay. maybe getting some heat this weekend, actually. Okay. Uh, it's actually been very cool. So I've been okay with that. <laughs> okay, good. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing your story today and for now joining me as the co-host as well. I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Anna Matthew, who supported me through my journey while pregnant as well. Dr. Anna Matthew is an associate professor of medicine at McMaster University, staff nephrologist at St. Joseph's Hospital, and co-medical director of hemodialysis. Did I get that all correct? You did, except I don't have the co anymore. I'm just the medical director of dialysis. Amazing. That's fantastic. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) So... Welcome, Dr. Matthew. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is a real pleasure. I'm so excited and happy to talk with both of you. A little different than what I usually do, but I'm very excited. Yeah, fantastic. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your history and how you decided to specialize in nephrology. I think during med school, I don't know, I was always drawn to the specialties that have a combination of acute medical situations where you have to work quickly and think quickly. But I always really appreciated that longstanding relationship and rapport that you develop with your patients that you care for over time. Mm -hmm. And so then that kind of whittled down some of the specialties such as ICU, for example, which, which is all the acute, and then some of the more like outpatient based, say endocrinology, rheumatology, where it's more more of that chronic. So I was left with a few choices. And then, so the way it works is you do med school, and then I did my residency in just internal medicine. And I just had a fantastic rotation in nephrology during my internal medicine residency. And then it became clear to me that's what I wanted to do. And I'm, yeah, I've never looked back. I've been very happy. Incredible. And so for our purposes today, we're discussing pregnancy, post-transplant. How did you end up getting into that world as well? Because I know that is a very specific niche area. Yeah, it's a really niche area. And there's not any thing or two-year rigorous program that you can go to that you learn everything that you need to do about this. And it's a specialty where experts pass down or hand down their knowledge. And and we have a network of uh, specialists that care in this area and work in this area. And we all share our knowledge together. We work together. So for me, I've been at McMaster for coming up to five years now. And uh, prior to that, I'm Canadian, but I did work in the States for a few years before I came here. And that was at a large academic center. And during my tenure there, the hospital that I worked at had a large population of women who were admitted. And so just by nature of my work there, I had a good exposure to women who had all different types of kidney issues. Many were pregnant, some were not. And I just found working with that population so incredibly rewarding and satisfying. And I felt so professionally fulfilled working in that population. I never thought that it would become a carved out niche and area in what I do. But I came to McMaster and at McMaster in our division of nephrology, there wasn't a dedicated provider. We're a large, we're a large center, but each of my colleagues was managing those patients on their own and or seeking help. And uh, the women who with kidney issues who were pregnant would have to travel as far as Toronto sometimes to try to seek care. And I decided to take on that role here. And I've been doing that dedicated role here in addition to my general nephrology and dialysis practice for coming up to five years now. And like I said, we don't have a formal training program for this. Hopefully in the future we will, but right now we don't. And so it's, it's a, it's, we have a network of providers all across Ontario and all across Canada. I and mean, we all know each other quite well. We share our experiences together. We seek advice from each other and pass our knowledge along. And that's how we, that's how we work. Amazing. That's incredible. Very, a very important role that with people <laughs> going through their journey yeah. and a pregnancy. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm wondering if you could share with us a little bit about this group of women who you've worked with who may be pre-dialysis or on dialysis or also transplanted who are thinking about pregnancy and what the difference between those groups of women would be if they were thinking about their fertility and the possibility of becoming pregnant. Yeah, so... To me, the preconception visit or visits, so before pregnancy, that's the most important work that I do. I really find that really important. That's where you can, you really want to inform the person sitting in front of you and their partner and their family, whoever's involved in these decisions, what are the risks? So there's a few things that I try to achieve first, and then I'll talk about the specific differences in those different populations you mentioned, but discussing what are the risks, what are the ways that we can optimize those risks or change the medications, try to treat any diseases or issues that may be there to really optimize things so that the 
pregnancy can be hopefully have the best outcome that it possibly could. And then I also just want, I like to reframe or change the tone of the discussion because many of the women who come to me, they've been told by many of the other providers that this is hopeless, that it's way too high risk. You both know that better than I do. And I think there can be a sense of trauma and a sense of psychological, almost a huge amount of stress. And so I try to reframe the conversation when I have these preconception visits that yes, you can have the family you want. And yes, you can achieve what you want to achieve. We need to monitor things very closely and we need to inform you of what the risk, but you're a smart, educated person. And if you know those risks and you follow through with all of the monitoring and screening that we need to do and wait for the timing, that's also important. I try to reframe things to a more positive note because many of the women who come to me, they haven't received that from any of their other care providers. And then the last thing that is really important in the preconception uh, period is contraception. (laughs) So while we're working on all of these things, we want to make sure that there's safe and appropriate contraception so that an unplanned pregnancy, we want to avoid that because then we haven't optimized things. The timing may not be correct. It's not the end of the world. We'll manage and we'll do our best, but we want to, we want to talk about contraception. So the preconception visit is the most important one, in my opinion, from what I do and how I practice. I just have to say, hearing from a physician, you talking about bringing a positive light to this and that it is possible, that's different from what a lot of us have heard in the past. And so just simply hearing that from you, I think is going to give so much hope and relief to so many women listening to this podcast. So thank you for starting off on that such incredibly hopeful tone. Yeah. I think, yeah, like like you alluded to, there's definitely moments in our journeys that the question came up and even between Candace and I and our experience going through, Candace had a very candid conversation from a previous doctor around like, this isn't going to happen. Whereas throughout mine, it was pretty, okay, well, let's just leave it for a while. But then when post-transplant was talked about, it was just like, okay, yeah, they knew what my goal was. And I've been fortunate. My team's been very supportive from the very beginning, but it is a I big think- piece. Yeah. And I think is there's more dedicated providers in this area and not just in obstetrical nephrology, but obstetrical endocrinology, obstetrical mm-hmm. cardiology, but McMaster, we, and a, and a Toronto as well. I, I know my colleagues, we have dedicated providers who specialize, have a general practice in their specialty, but a, one of the niche that they've carved out is the obstetrical or the pregnant person. I think there's a I don't want to say ease because we never feel at ease. We always are walking down that path with you and sharing all of that with you. But I think there is a sense that this is achievable in many cases and it is possible along with as long as there's the appropriate amount of screening and monitoring and uh, timing is crucial. And that preconception kind of optimization is also crucial. So hopefully all care providers' minds will be moved a little bit more in that direction, as opposed to the just flat out, no, you can't have a family or you need to adopt. That's the only way to move forward here. And how does it change Candice is bringing up around like those looking to prior to like low CKD or dialysis post-transplant, that timing piece, as you said, it's really important. And then uh, kind of along with that, especially with females that are end-stage renal disease, is it a harder time for them to conceive compared to someone that's maybe post-transplant? What do you see in your world there around the different impacts? Right. The patient on We'll talk about women because there's also the issue of men and their fertility, right? And in women, as the kidney function or the GFR, the percentage of kidney function, as it declines, moving towards pre-dialysis and dialysis, fertility reduces drastically. And that's for several reasons. So first is your hormonal axis that coordinates the different surges of different hormones at different times during your cycle that allows ovulation to happen. That becomes completely dysregulated. And as you approach 10, 5% kidney function and on dialysis, it's completely dysregulated. And in fact, the vast majority of women who are on dialysis don't have a period at all. Yeah, I didn't. didn't Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I didn't. it went away completely when I was on dialysis. Yeah. And not, that doesn't mean that you can't get pregnant on dialysis, but it's an exceedingly small proportion of women. These, the studies that we know, it's a little tricky because part of it is that these women may have been counseled, don't even try to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then some of them, uh, so not all of them may have been trying to become pregnant. And the studies that we know of, it's very small percentage of women on dialysis that are becoming pregnant. And after transplant, well, first I should let me back up. So there's a few, like I was saying, there's a few reasons why fertility is so low as you're approaching dialysis and on dialysis. So one is that the hormonal access is dysregulated and very abnormal. The second, and this is more in men, there can be, in women, there can be issues with, we call vasomotor function or how the blood flows and the nervous system flows. So erectile dysfunction is kind of 
what I'm getting at, exceedingly common. And then the third in, in men and women is psychological issues. So depression and decreased libido is exceedingly common in the pre-dialysis and dialysis patients, both men and women. And so that, of course, can also contribute to low fertility. So then segue to transplant. So even as soon as two to three months after transplant, the hormonal axis can become regulated again. Menses, uh, menstruation, the period can return in women even two, three months after transplant. Libido can return, I think in men up to normal and women almost up to normal in whatever studies that are available there. Sperm count, which is very low in men, can return back up to normal within a few months. And so fertility can greatly improve. Now it doesn't go back up to the general population level fertility. So if you look at studies of pregnancy rates in women who are post transplant compared to non transplant, it's still quite a bit lower, 40, 50% lower. Now were these women counseled don't ever think about getting pregnant or were they were they all trying to become pregnant? I don't know. But the fertility rates, the pregnancy rates are quite a bit lower. In men, sperm counts can return back to pretty much normal within a two, three, four months post-transplant. And so then again, in the immediate post-transplant period, because that's not the time, that's not the ideal window to get pregnant, right? Well, at right. least you will, I'm sure you're going to ask me that question, but we want to wait at least a year, maybe even longer. And so in the first two or three months post-transplant, both for men and for women, it's really important to counsel about contraception because fertility can return, not really the immediately post-transplant, but that is not the optimal sort of timing in which to become pregnant. Hope that answers your questions. So I waited 12 years to get (laughs) pregnant. (laughs) So that's a long time post-transplant. Whereas Kate, you were... I was only about two, three, in between year two and three. So yeah, just like you said, Dr. Matthew, it was like, you have to wait at least that year before we look at the med changes, that sort of thing. And so we hit that year and that meeting, I'm like, okay, it's the one year mark. (laughs) Um, You know, and there was for me personally, there was that bit of nervousness of, because I had prior to transplant some med changes that didn't go well, because we had hoped maybe to have a child before and that didn't happen. So when it was time for med change, there was a bit of nervousness on my end about making that. But to be honest, it was flawless because my body was in a better place, right? It was healthier again. It was better compared. So even though we didn't wait as long, and maybe this is part of why it took us a little longer to get pregnant with my daughter compared to Candace, she had lots of time and then they got Mm -hmm. pregnant pretty fast that it took a little bit longer for us. And we almost were starting the path of, do we need to look at fertility and that aspect of things? Fortunately, and as Candace and I earlier in the (laughs) session, it's sometimes it's an unexpected experience expected surprise when all of a sudden the one month you think that likely nothing and oh there we go finally you're pregnant (laughs) it's an interesting journey that yeah maybe there is something to be said I think if my age kind of played and that was actually a kind of a a follow-up question is does age play a factor and Mm -hmm. I think if we were a bit younger that we probably maybe would have waited a couple of years post transplant because I had a few of my nephrologists kind of say the opportune time is kind of more closer maybe to two years post transplant versus one year. But uh, here we are and I've thankfully had one and, and now pregnant with the other and that sort of thing. But it does age play a factor, I guess. Just respond to what you said. Congratulations again. And kind of the stress for any woman who's thinking about perhaps there's some fertility issues that I need to think about. And then on top of that, overlaying on top of that, having a transplant, your medications have changed, all those additional stresses. So that's a lot to contend with. And I'm sure there was some fertility issue related to the transplant. And then who knows, we we will never know if there was some underlying fertility issue that was just there from the beginning, right? But anyways, congratulations, you said you're on the last leg there. So so (laughs) it's nice to hear. And yes, age definitely does play a role. Just like in any, any woman, age 35 is around the, the And it's not that it's not that something drastically happens on your 35th birthday, there is (laughs) A decline that happens so maybe starting around 34 at 35 the decline in fertility kind of gets a little bit faster and depending on when you had your transplant and then being advised to wait the one to two years so us clinicians we follow these clinical guidelines and so depend which kind of is a document that kind of summarizes all the studies and the evidence and the literature for a practicing healthcare provider and rises based on what experts think and what the literature thinks, what are the best recommendations we can make for our patients. And depending on which guideline you look at, somewhere between one to two years seems to be the optimal timing 
post-transplant. Now, if someone has a transplant when they're 38 years old, we may want to adjust that a little bit more as opposed to if they have a transplant when they're 28 years old, right? If the graft function is excellent, maybe you'll ask me this question coming up, what are the things that would make you at risk for more complications? But if the graft function is excellent, there's been no problems with rejections or infections, the blood pressure is great, then we would feel a little more confident to say perhaps closer to the one year your mark, you can start to try to become pregnant as opposed to if there were any of those issues that I just mentioned, you'd want to try to optimize or sort those things out first, wait a period of time, make sure everything's stable. That might be then approaching more towards the two-year mark. But we would certainly, I would certainly, and your transplant doc would certainly take that into consideration if you're 38 versus your 28. Understanding just natural female fertility starts to decline in and around the 35-year age mark. I love being considered geriatric this time. Around. That's oh right. my gosh, right? <laughs> I've also had basically three geriatric pregnancies. Where is the petition designed to remove yeah. that word, right? That's right. Is there yeah. not a better word for no. than geriatric? Right? No. I also don't like the tag high risk. Everyone keeps saying you're high risk. Yeah. You're high. It's not a nice, not probably nice, not a nice thing to hear that you're high risk. So we, we try not to say that either. Yeah. My specialist always tries to put it, you're on the low end of the high there risk. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, right. For people like my husband and I, who had over a decade of a very successful tr- kidney transplant, I was very healthy and things were going really well. We really went back and forth often about whether or not we were going to have children. And I feel like one of us might have been on the fence where we were like, yeah, I think we should do that. And the other one was like, ah sure, but maybe not right now. And we went back and forth until we got to this point where it was becoming a reality that we thought we wanted to have a family. So for those people out there who are living with end stage renal disease and who aren't quite sure about whether or not they want to have a child, what advice would you give to somebody who is in this community that we're in? Maybe some of the advice that we hear at our first appointment with you or something that they could think about while they're making these decisions. I think, again, I just like to reframe this conversation to one of hope. I'd say measured hope. And the vast majority of women and their partners that I see in my clinic, they they just like you, Candice, they were on tenterhooks, either trying to struggle with this decision or wanting to have a family, but being told that they can't or it's too dangerous and really wanting to adhere and stick to whatever recommendation their care providers have for them. They really want to stick to that. So that's very rarely a concern or an issue, perhaps occasionally even the one-off type of situation. But and oftentimes there's other social reasons or economic reasons, which are very unfortunate that kind of dictate that. But that's one thing is just understanding that this pregnancy, if you have kidney disease, it's not going to be like the pregnancy of your friend or your neighbor where they kind of show up once a month or once every four months and then have some blood work and get their blood pressure taken. And then they leave the expectation that there is going to be a lot of care providers. There's going to be a lot of monitoring. So understanding that, I think, first off. And then, like I said, in the preconception visit, we do talk about some of the risks and how we mitigate or reduce those risks. First, for the person who's pregnant, preeclampsia is something that I do spend some time and I talk about. And if you have a severe kidney disease on dialysis or approaching dialysis, and if you have a kidney transplant, the risk of preeclampsia, which is a specific kind of blood pressure that only affects pregnancy, that's caused by hormones that are secreted in the placenta, that risk of preeclampsia is very high. If you don't have any kidney issues and you haven't had a transplant, somewhere around two to 3% of pregnancies are affected by preeclampsia. It can be 10 times or even higher than that in the populations that we're talking about. And preeclampsia, the only way to really treat it, it can cause problems in multiple different organs. And really the only way to treat it is to remove the placenta because that's what the, where the problem is, which means ending the pregnancy right? So we do spend some time talking about that. What does that mean? What the seriousness of it is, the importance of really monitoring blood pressure carefully. We talk about certain medications like aspirin that you can take, which greatly reduces your risk of preeclampsia, but doesn't eliminate it altogether, but reduces the risk. And we talk about the importance of monitoring the baby, seeing the high risk maternal fetal medicine obstetrician where you can have more frequent ultrasounds where they measure the make sure baby's growing well measure the placenta and the blood flows in the placenta because that that also helps us determine whether preeclampsia is happening regular blood work every two to four weeks it is intensive but we understand that we're placing a lot of intensive monitoring on these women and these families and these people but it's all to try to detect these complications which can be severe so we talk about preeclampsia we talk about the risk of the baby being born 
born early, which can be up to 50% of women that have had a kidney transplant will end up delivering early, often for medical reasons. So preeclampsia develops, the baby starts to look a bit small on the ultrasound, the blood pressure starts to drive up. That's another thing that can happen at the end of pregnancy. And so for those reasons, a medically earlier delivery is often indicated. And because of that, the baby's smaller, right? So either other issues in the pregnancy or just the, by fact of being delivered early, the baby can be smaller. So those are the main things I talk about in a someone who's had a transplant, I also try to focus on some positives. Once you are pregnant, the live birth rate's actually very similar to someone who didn't have a transplant. And that's good to know. I think that's a good thing to know that once you're pregnant and you've passed the first trimester and you're testing, just like in any pregnancy, transplant or not, or kidney disease or not, some pregnancies end the majority of the time in the first trimester. But the chances of that happening just because you have a transplant isn't really any different. So I try to remind of that. And then the other thing I try to remind is, especially if you've had one baby and you want to have your second baby or your third baby, being pregnant itself doesn't seem to have an impact on your graft. So when we look at how the life of the kidney graft is in people who never got pregnant, compared to similar people who got pregnant once or twice, the graft seems to last about the same amount of time. And that's also a reassuring thing, right? So I try to spend some time and talk about that. Then that individual person sitting in front of me, I would want to individualize this discussion a little bit. And so we look at the things that we know might not might are associated with worse outcomes, either for the baby or for the mom. So how well is the blood pressure controlled? So that's a really important factor. You want the blood pressure to be really well controlled going into the pregnancy. How much protein is there in the urine? So we, mm-hmm. minimal or no protein in the urine is ideal situation. And then the third thing is how well is the kidney functioning? So the kidney function is normal or close to normal. The percentage of kidney function is close to hundred. That is also a great profile. So based on what those numbers look like, I can individualize the discussion a little bit. So that, that's kind of like a, just a realistic discussion that I have. And hopefully there's some hopeful points, but also some more realistic points and then knowing what to expect as you embark on this. And all of us who practice this try to spend a little bit of time in the preconception visit and go over so that there's not many surprises. So we know what to expect. Amazing. All the things you're saying, it's the world I'm living in right now. The protein in urine and the preeclampsia, that's where I am in my second pregnancy right now. It's weekly blood work, obstetrician every two weeks, kidney clinic with my nephrology team every four weeks. It's actually, I think I'm down to two weeks now. The nice thing, and again, something that Candace and I have experienced compared to the general population is just the monitoring Yes, we don't like to use the word high risk. You do get that extra follow, which is Mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. And it keeps hopefully the nervousness on our end as growing these little humans and that sort of thing. And just reflecting on the early pregnancy and having them a bit early. Candace and I, again, our differences of we both had children one month early. Hers was a tiny little thing and mine was like a normal (laughs) size baby. And so I always joke, I'm okay, why? And even this time around, like, this little guy is measuring in the 90th percentile. And I'm Whoa. like, why are my babies so big? She, my <laughs> obstetrician is just so sweet. She's like, you just have a very healthy placenta. There like, you go. Oh, <laughs> I feel Amazing. very fortunate. <laughs> I just joke that they know that they're going to be coming early. And you're thinking so to say you're obstetrician, you're not the one that has to deliver this baby now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Got to come out. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Uh, he's breech right now. So that's kind of part of the, oh, the okay. uh, possible extra challenge this time yeah. around, uh, which yeah. that's part of you with any pregnancy, you don't know. And I guess the positive, I guess, is that we know that because I've had an extra ultrasound kind of at around that 29 weeks. And we could see that, okay, yeah, feet down, head up. So let's monitor until about 35 weeks. And if your water breaks, go to the hospital is what I was pretty much told. It's nice having that little extra checkpoints along the way, I have to say. And that's been really helpful for sure. It's nice to hear you both talk about that. Everyone listening here, if there's women or people or families who are thinking about embarking on this to really understand what you're getting yourself in for. It is quite intensive. Wouldn't you both say like the monitoring? I think we can also, we try to do, try to, and I think we can do better uh, uh, as your healthcare providers, try to consolidate your care a little bit, keep in touch with you, but have you doing less separate different clinic visits, try to consolidate our blood work in a way. So you're not doing four different sets of blood work every month. We have an appreciation. And I, I think all of us who practice this, like I was saying 
earlier. I know the whole network at McMaster of every care provider who provides obstetrical care. And I know the obstetrical medicine folk, and I know the maternal fetal medicine, the obstetricians. And so I think we all try our best to work together and collaborate first so that we can have a cohesive plan for each person going through the pregnancy, but then also to try to consolidate and have you have less visits. So you get the same care, but with hopefully every time you go to a visit, you can maximize your time there and see different providers. When you do blood work, it's going to multiple different providers. So that also, I think, is an important piece that we can work better on as healthcare providers in this intensive monitoring period that you're going through. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very true. And I think, and I'm sure we'll chat about a little bit more of the world of COVID that we live in, but I do have to say that having now the last little bit of my first pregnancy and my entire kind of still in the COVID world, I've been very thankful for some virtual visits. My obstetrician, clearly I need to see her in person, actually going later today, getting the heart rate, checking things out, but being able to, because I'm still working full time, right? To be able to just log in and see some of my medical professionals and go through. So at least a couple of those appointments, especially in these later weeks that are happening a lot, that's been a huge benefit of having that virtual option, which I would say probably beforehand was not a possibility. So I think I joked earlier, Candace, that this is kind of my other full-time job right now is the medical side of things, but just, as I say, just as important because it's, these are important weeks uh, ahead coming up. I think COVID really opened all of our eyes to the benefits of virtual visit. There are some like your obstetrician who needs to lay hands on you, do the ultrasound. You need to be there in person for that. But, and I think that people who are pregnant, they're actually the ideal population, ideal type of person to have a virtual visit because you are having an in-person visit with one of your care providers, right? The obstetrician, you're young, generally tech savvy, right? You know know how to operate your computer. Hopefully there are socioeconomic factors. Sometimes you may not have a computer or have access to internet, but barring that, more likely than not how to operate your phone or your computer. You're very willing and wanting to uh, attend every appointment. So even though there's a lot of appointments, you're willing and able and wanting to attend all of them. So I think that it's really opened all of our eyes to the importance of virtual care, especially for people like you. That's great. And I, for one, intend to, even after COVID, I definitely intend to continue to use virtual visit, especially for my pregnant patients before this mm-hmm. exact reason that it helps you as you're going through all of your multiple appointments. It really does. It kind of takes a little bit of the stress off to know that and coming from different areas of the province, for me, it's an hour drive to get to Hamilton, Be out an hour there, an hour back and an hour of an appointment, perhaps that's a big chunk of your day. And when you're pregnant, once you get later onto the pregnancy, you're like, I I just don't have the energy to do. Really appreciate the fact that we're doing some virtual visits. And Mm -hmm. I think it gives us more time as well to be settled and to think about some of the questions that, you know, I know that there's often stress and worry when you go in and you're worked up because you want to know how things are going. I think it, it adds a little bit of calm that you're at your own home and you can think about things that that you may not have thought about before. Yeah, that's a, that's really important. That's the most important. That's what we want. We want you to be in a calm frame of mind so you can ask all of your questions and maybe have other people with you mm-hmm. attend the appointment as well that may not have been able to attend if you had to come here and pay for parking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So thinking about all of those teams as a kidney patient, when we do get pregnant, who are those teams that that we would naturally see in this process? Yeah, so it would would start off with your family physician, right? That's a very important person through the entire process, but especially in the first trimester. Everyone practices slightly differently, but the way I practice in the first trimester, the initial blood testing and ultrasounds and the first trimester labs, that's usually coordinated by the family doctor. And then I, hopefully I've done a preconception visit. And so if I've done a preconception visit, all of the women and people and families that I work with are well aware to contact me ASAP. So I want to know about it immediately. Again, the vast majority, especially in kidney transplant, you're also seeing your transplant physician, right? So you've told them, plus you've told likely me as well that you're planning a pregnancy. So medications have already all been adjusted to be pregnancy safe. Everything else is optimized in the way that we had discussed. And I find out, and often you would tell your transplant physician as well, like immediately as soon as the first positive pregnancy test comes. And the obstetrician's not involved yet, at least in McMaster, this is how we operate. I would see along with the family doctor as many times as needed once or twice, usually in the first trimester. And we're available for any questions or issues that pop up in between as well. 
And then our maternal fetal medicine unit is situated at McMaster University Medical Center. I would place a referral there. Now in Hamilton, we are geographically separate. I practice out of St. Joe's Hospital and the uh, obstetricians that would uh, work with you are situated in a different hospital. We still work closely together. So we collaborate together. We email, call, text, message all the time together, but we're geographically separate. There are other places like in Toronto, for example, where both of those providers are on site at the same place and actually run a clinic together, which I think is a really nice model. Mm -hmm. We are separated by geography, unfortunately, here in Hamilton. We still do our best to make things work. And I have switched nearly all, perhaps maybe not the first visit, but after that, all of the visits to virtual visits to alleviate the all these extra trips. And so you just, in Hamilton, you would just visit McMaster in person to see your obstetrician your maternal fetal medicine specialist, and then your other visits would be separate. There may be other specialists involved too. So if there is an issue with diabetes or gestational diabetes, there would be an obstetrical endocrinologist involved. If there's clotting factor issues, there might be a hematologist involved. If there's glomerulonephritis or autoimmune issues that caused you to have a kidney transplant, there might be a rheumatologist involved. So we have sort of obstetrical providers for all of those specialties that I mentioned. And so they may also, some or all of them may also be involved. So it is a, it is a lot of follow-ups. That's a big team. And then many of us also have pharmacists that are kind of crucial and key because of the dosing of uh, medication for us specifically, we have a transplant pharmacist and we have an obstetrical nephrology pharmacist. Sometimes there's the same covering, sometimes it's two different. So th- those people would also see you. Our nurses are uh, of course always key and provide a lot of support and advice as well. So big team, but uh, we all work together. We run up around the medication aspect of things and uh, that plays a big part, especially for post-transplant and that sort of thing. I know I can reflect in my journey so far of one of the post-medications, there's a lot of changes happening. And so as part of that process, blood work to monitor that because I get the email from my nurse. Okay, how are you feeling? Trying to figure out where the dosage should be. I'm assuming that's kind of the same for no matter where you are in your journey, the medication aspect of things is an important. Yeah, it's crucial. It's crucial, especially your or your cyclosporin, the calcineurin inhibitor. That's that class of medication. One of the classes of your immunosuppression that you need to take when you have a transplant. The dose of that pretty early in pregnancy likely has to be increased. And that's because there's a few reasons. Your body tends to metabolize it more when you're pregnant. Also, when you're pregnant, uh, as you're aware, you're, you have more plasma volume, you know, you're swollen, you're bigger, that level gets diluted in a way, so to speak. So because of that, you, the dose needs to be increased. One of the reasons that you could have some problems with your kidney function during pregnancy is actually a level of rejection, because if that dose is not adjusted up quickly within the first few weeks of pregnancy, and maybe both of you experienced that as well, the level may end up being too low, actually. Um, Mm -hmm. And then the the opposite is also true. Post-delivery, the dose needs to be monitored really closely and adjusted back down. So that's Mm -hmm. our pharmacist is crucial in that, coordinating that and looking at that, along with the physician and the nurse too. So we were lucky to have the pharmacist help in all pregnancy cases that I help with, but in the transplant patients especially, it's really important and helpful. The increase is real, that's for sure. I'm kind of at one of my higher doses and it's, yeah, the weekly blood work right now just to monitor where things are at. to to keep that. And thankfully, my function is still very happy at this point. So I'm thankful for that. So the medication is doing what it needs to do. How how does that feel? It must be disconcerting or a bit anxiety provoking, right? You're used to stable. I mean, the point is before pregnancy, you're on a very stable dose for a very long time. That's what we want in in order to say that you have a green light to go ahead and try to conceive. And then as soon as you get pregnant, we're adjusting doses up and down through the pregnancy and postpartum. So that must be a little disconcerting or difficult. Yeah, I think there is definitely, as soon as I see the numbers, like my function, as we may have chatted already, and especially in the early months of pregnancy too, sometimes our kidney function actually can increase, Mm -hmm. a good increase because of the blood flow and that sort of thing. So there's always that reassurance when you see that GFR number being in a good place. And I think it gets more nerve wracking. And now that I've been through the process once and here I am on the second one, I know these coming weeks, I'm naturally going to see my GFR maybe come down a little bit, but I'm monitoring as soon as my results are up, I'm wanting to see. And yeah, and I'm hoping that, yeah, medication's helping keeping that stable and that as well, because it all plays into it. And there's still always a little bit of nervousness. You just, Mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're okay and the baby's okay and that sort of thing. And you don't want to deliver too early. And I think 
I know in my journey, there were certain kind of milestones throughout the pregnancy that are super important from the medical side of things for the child and viability and then needing maybe some support. And then kind of after a certain point, things are looking really optimistic. Right. I guess everyone's a little different of what weeks are most important, but is there an overall kind of from your guys' perspective of goals throughout someone's pregnancy of weeks and I mean, I definitely lean on the obstetrician to help me with that. And they are as so careful with the multiple scans that are done. They're checking the baby, the fetus, to see how the growth is and the anatomy. But equally important, they're checking the placenta because the placental health, well, the way the placenta looks and the blood flow that the placenta, I mean, it's its own organ, right? You actually are growing a whole new organ in addition to a whole human being. And so the health of the placenta is also really important. And its viability and its health also helps us in terms of how the pregnancy is progressing. The weeks, we know 24, 25 weeks in terms of viability. And then I think once you hit that 32 to 35 week mark, I think in there, you're not looking at such severe outcomes in terms of needing to be in the NICU for a long period of time. 37 weeks would be full term. So that would be a huge bonus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but as most or 50% or even in some studies, even more than 50%, more than half of uh, women or people who are pregnant uh, can deliver before that. So mm -hmm. if you make it to 37 weeks, I think that's that's probably an amazing feat. <laughs> that was definitely our goal. We had yeah. that number in our head. We were like, come on, 37. 37, yeah. Which we didn't make it to, but right. we made it to 36, which yeah. our team was really happy about. And I think some of the fears of the health of the baby when they're coming that premature were there. But thankfully for us, Clementine was born really small, but she was very healthy. And I was overwhelmed when we made it to recovery. And one of the nurses said, would you like to try breastfeeding? Yeah. And for me, I've mentioned this before, but there's so many parts of our journey as kidney patients where we feel like our bodies have failed us or that something has happened that um, we couldn't have any impact on because it's happened to us. But for some reason, we have this feeling of failure. No, it's even in the name kidney failure, right? Mm -hmm. We have this yeah. feeling. And I remember just being so grateful that not only was this an option for me now, but that in recovery, I was able to nurse my daughter and I'm still nursing now. She's 15 months and I've been very lucky that I've been able to nurse her, but that was also a, a really big question for us with our medication and potentially having a premature baby, would that be possible? And so I guess the question for you is how does that medication affect breastfeeding and in, in that? So we try, I and all of my colleagues who practice this type of medicine, we really try to make a very clear message that if you choose to breastfeed, we will do our utmost to make sure that you can breastfeed. Mm -hmm. And so the medications that are optimized or changed in the pre-pregnancy state, the goal and the ideal is to just continue through on them through until you finish pregnancy and finish your breastfeeding journey if you choose to breastfeed. That's really the goal. Now the doses may need to be adjusted, like how I stated. If you are on any blood pressure medications, your immunosuppressive medications, any other medications that you're on during your pregnancy, the goal is to sort of make it as seamless as we can for you if you wish to if you wish to breastfeed so that you can breastfeed when uh, we look at studies on what are the breastfeeding rates in women and people who have had any transplant so not just a kidney transplant but any transplant they were quite abysmal actually like less than 20 percent in the 90s which isn't really that long ago <laughs> no it's not it. <laughs> this is u.s data where maybe the breastfeeding rates are lower but they but the good news is that they have been increasing successively increasing up until the mid 2000s or 2015 2016 or so they and hopefully will continue to increase if you do wish to breastfeed and you want to breastfeed then we try our utmost to promote that and encourage that and in terms of the medications again just like how in pregnancy it's very hard for clinicians to say this is safe so you probably Right. Yes. <laughs> There's always a report or a case of an adverse problem that happened. Would it have happened anyways if the medication hadn't been on board? We don't know. So we right. can't ever say 
something is 100% safe. And I'm sure you've experienced that during pregnancy or with breastfeeding, we can say we feel very comfortable and we have a lot of experience and there's a very low risk that this would happen. For breastfeeding specifically, there's lots of studies on milk transfer. So how much of the blood, just how you check a tracrolimus level in the blood, we can check a tracrolimus level in the breast milk. So how much of that is actually being transferred into the breast milk? And so we would pick medications that have a very low milk transfer. And so we know, we know what those are and we would hopefully have organized your medications preconception to ha- have you have as seamless journey as possible with that if you choose to breastfeed. Amazing. Earlier, the breastfeeding aspect, I had just assumed prior to having that pre-conversation that breastfeeding wasn't going to be an option. And it was actually my kidney pregnancy specialist and she brought up about breastfeeding and the possibility. And it's just it's like, okay. Now I went into a pregnancy and having my child and very open that this may or may not happen. And for me, myself, it was definitely a struggle at first, partly I'm guessing because she was a full month early, but luckily we hit a stride and it took a while because for me, I know personally, I got so used to pumping milk and when it finally started to come in that then I had this, I knew how much she was having. And that was kind of reassurance for me versus just mm-hmm. natural breastfeeding. Right. But finally, again, I reflect and I was able to breastfeed and I kind of nicely cut her off around 19 months because I'm like, yeah, I'm already pregnant with your other sibling. <laughs> Let's give a bit of a break, but I feel fortunate and we'll see what happens second time around as you just don't know what your body's going to do. But I feel Feel fortunate I had that experience. I felt like that was something normal to experience, which four years ago, I didn't even think was a possibility. So it was nice to be able to go through that. So it's just, again, those conversations with your medical team and how important those are and asking all the questions. So sometimes you're pleasantly surprised with some of the information that you're given. Absolutely. And I'm so happy to hear that both of you had wanted to breastfeed and that you were both able to successfully do well. Kate, you until you wanted to, and then Candace until you <laughs> wish to continue so as long as you wish to continue. Yeah. So that's really great to hear. Now I know, and I think uh, Candace, this is one of the other topics we wanted to hit on around antibodies and having children and how does that impact our sensitivity for future transplants? And Candace and I, in our earlier conversation, we're really reflecting around the future and what that means for us and our families and that sort of thing. But from the medical standpoint, antibodies play a big piece when you have children and then transplant. How, how does that work on your side? there's a few things that can happen after you've had a kidney transplant that we call a sensitizing event. Anything where your body is exposed to a non-self or something that's not you when your body inside you is exposed. So one of those things is a kidney transplant. So that's considered a sensitizing event that can induce more antibodies. That's just your body trying to protect itself against this non-self that it's that it's seeing and making more antibodies. So a transplant is one of those things. I think you probably know this already. Blood transfusion is one of those things. Having a pregnancy is one of those things. And so, yes, each successive pregnancy would be considered a sensitizing event. Now, the goal would be to have pregnancy when your graft function is very good, and hopefully you have a long graft function left. The issue of sensitization comes up when you're trying to embark upon a kidney transplant, right? Because it's the, if you're more highly sensitized, there's more antibodies that you have against non-self, it's more difficult to find a match or a good match, and there's a higher risk of a rejection. So that's where that issue comes up. So you're absolutely right. We try our best to counsel on that. Each successive pregnancy is considered a sensitizing event. You know, how much it will sensitize you. We have ways to quantify that. There's this panel of reactive antibodies or the PRA. I don't know if you're familiar with it. There's a PRA that they check to see what is the percentage or how much sensitization you have. And people who are going in for a kidney transplant will have that value checked. But each successive pregnancy would be a sensitizing event. That's definitely something that we need to counsel on, especially with each subsequent pregnancy. But the goal is to have those pregnancies when you have very good and healthy graft function and to avoid another transplant for as long as possible, right? So, yeah. So thinking about getting pregnant and for people who have a genetic disease, with different genetic diseases, what are the chances to pass that on to the baby? And is there any type of preventative measures to try to not pass that on? It depends on the genetic disease. So some are recessive, some diseases are dominant. And so that just will affect the chances that there's a mother copy and a father copy of the gene. So if it's dominant, you just need one copy in order to have the disease. If it's recessive, you need two copies. That's my layman's (laughs) explanation (laughs) 
Yeah. I'm not right. a geneticist, so <laughs> you'd be surprised how much little more than that I understand it. <laughs> Knowing that you have a genetic disease, I think having an additional layer of preconception counseling would be key at this point. So in addition to your specific risks, just in terms of the baby and maternal health during the pregnancy, you would want an additional layer of preconception counseling from a genetic counselor or from a genetics clinic that can go into the details of what is the actual risk that you'll pass it to the baby. Because there's the genetic passing on of the disease, but then there's something called phenotype, which is actually expressing the disease. And those aren't always okay. the same. So you may have the gene, but you never may not express the disease or may not express it to as high of a degree. So it is a bit of nuance there and understanding what exactly is the risk to pass it on. So mm -hmm. that I would strongly encourage an extra layer of preconception genetic counseling in that setting. And I would, you know, if I was seeing uh, somebody in my preconception clinic, I would strongly advise that. Something that's relatively more common, like polycystic kidney disease, that's something that we mm -hmm. might see that is a, a dominant disease. And so there's a 50% chance to pass that down. Is there anything that we can do to prevent? So that's a complicated question. There is, I believe in the Toronto area, fertility clinics that can do through IVF in vitro fertilization. And they can actually, in terms of like gender or other just preferred, possibly preferred genetic traits, obviously we can't choose, but if it's in terms of preventing a disease, there mm -hmm. are certain clinics, they would take the egg and the sperm and do genetic analysis on that and then pick an embryo that's created that does not have that genetic defect and then implant into the person who's becoming pregnant. So wow. that is a possibility. And that is done at some, I believe, fertility clinics. That's fascinating. Um, I've had many patients that have, that I've cared for with polycystic kidney disease. They generally have said the risk is the risk. We understand the risk. They do some preconception counseling and then they proceed. Mm -hmm. So I haven't had a patient pursue this sort of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and embryo selection, but that is a for disease states, I should be very clear for disease states, yes. not for gender, et cetera, or right. sex for disease states. That is sometimes a possibility. So I hope that's clear. Yeah. 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 And so for a child who is born with that hereditary disease, would they be monitored automatically throughout their lives? Would that be set up through their family doctor or would that be something that the parents would need to know and acknowledge and advocate throughout the child's life. I, I think parents should always know and advocate because there's always gaps in healthcare, isn't there? So they yeah. should always know and they should always advocate. If it's a disease that does often tend to present in the child or the infant, the pediatric nephrologist would be involved and could monitor for that. Now, in terms of genetic testing, it's an, a bit of an ethical situation, isn't it? So if it's a disease that only presents in adulthood, there's a chance that the baby may not have that disease. And maybe right. if that baby was an adult, they may not want to know right? that pursuing genetic testing in the absence of any clinical symptoms in a child or a baby is a bit of an ethical conundrum. I hope you can understand. So oftentimes that's not advocated. However, if there are clinical signs, say the baby is developing some protein in the urine or the baby is developing some high blood pressure or some of the features of this genetic disease that the baby's parent our parents have, then yes, you would consider genetic testing and the pediatric nephrologist would help set that up. I'm not a pediatric nephrologist, but that's my understanding of how that situation is handled. So yeah. Amazing. In the world of kidney research and innovation around how has the view around pregnancy within the renal community changed? Is there anything new and exciting that's coming up that you've heard about for around research just to continue to grow and develop. What it sounds like you guys are doing is bringing that conversation, that hope, which is so important. But from the research side of things, is there anything that they're watching and monitoring and things in the renal world right now? There are some markers, blood markers of preeclampsia. Maybe you've heard about these or not, which is very exciting. Currently only available kind of in a research study setting. So I can't just order them. I wish that I could. That is a very exciting development. Pretty good data around it, just not available, still being studied so that we can understand how to interpret the results exactly, but there are different markers that are released by the placenta and the ratio of those, if they're abnormal, is predictive or is very strongly associated with future development of preeclampsia. So that's really helpful, right? We could maybe reduce some of this intensive monitoring and surveillance that we've discussed earlier that can really affect your life for those nine months and beyond if we had a more robust way to 
point to this, you are at higher risk of preeclampsia, but you're not. Both of you have had a kidney transplant, but your your placenta looks like it's going to develop preeclampsia because like I mentioned before, it's the placenta that is the culprit there. So that is pretty exciting. And we definitely, all of us in this field are watching that pretty closely. And then on a more, not research front, but I, I just, again, what you had discussed about just reframing or changing this message. I think all of us are working really hard on that to take the burden and off of you so that it's your job to do all the monitoring and all of the work and all the stress. And we want to try to help you with that and walk down that path with you. And I think talking to both of you has been really helpful for me too, to understand from your side. We suggest and advocate for these things and monitoring and testing, but you're the one that has to walk down that. So I appreciate hearing both of your stories and what that was like and what it continues to be like for both of you. Oh, well, thank you for joining us and all of this information that you've brought to us. And I think anyone listening is going to be extremely grateful that you've given us all of this information and hope. And also it gives us an idea of if you're thinking about this, some of the things that you might need to expect, which aren't really included in those what to expect when you're expecting books right. or apps, right? <laughs> There's not a what to expect when you're expecting right. and you have kidney disease. And you have, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right? So yeah. Yeah. I think that's really helpful for us. Before we both leave, I have a question to ask you both that is not related at mm-hmm. all. <laughs> we like to end on a fun and positive note. So I'll start with you, Dr. Matthew. If you were a tree, what kind <laughs> of tree would you be? There's, I think that they're called the silver birch tree. I'm Canadian, as I mentioned before, but I worked in New York City for a number of years before I came here. And so I lived in Brooklyn, but in the center of Manhattan, like right near the public library there, there's just a place where you can sit and eat lunch or relax. And there's the, all these beautiful silver birch trees. And I just have such a wonderful memory of that. So if I could be not any birch tree, the one in right there, right there. <laughs> that's what I would be. <laughs> and what about you, Kate? I love the look and the feel of a weeping willow. And I know it sounds really sad, but childhood memory of actually my grandparents' place in Ontario, they had this massive weeping willow. And it, as a child, it was really cool to kind of go in and hide. And it's just so peaceful and calm looking. If I was to be, it would be a weeping willow. I love that. That's amazing. What about you? How about you, Candace? <laughs> so I actually mentioned this on another episode because they asked me as well. So I'll probably repeat it several times in the season, but I'm with you. So I absolutely adore birch trees. I spent most of my summers up in the Kawarthas with great grandparents who had cottages up there. And it just brings me back to thinking about the lake and loons and cicadas and the smell of northern Ontario lakes there's just something so peaceful to my soul to think about birch trees and lakes and so I'm I always go up to the Kawarthas every single year that's like my little piece of heaven and so I think if I could be anything it would be a birch tree in the Kawarthas <laughs> so we're in the same family there you go. Matthew, yeah. but <laughs> in different locations yeah. <laughs> so I just want to echo again our gratitude and thank you so much for being here today with us and sharing all of your extensive knowledge to kidney patients and for being a voice that we often don't hear as patients because it's amazing to get to go through the process and talk with different healthcare providers through your journey, but it's another thing to get to sit down and listen to all of this in-depth information directly from you. So thank you so much for being here today. It's been a real pleasure talking to both of you and learning from both of you too. Thank you. And Kate as well. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your beautiful journey of your first gorgeous little wee one and now the one to come. We're so excited for you and I hope that you'll share some photos in the next few weeks, hoping that you go (laughs) that full term and you have a beautiful, healthy baby boy. And we're looking forward to seeing those pictures for sure and hearing about how things go. Thank you so much for having me. And as I go through my kidney journey, sharing one's journey, I find it therapeutic to share with others of the ups and downs of the journey. And I just feel fortunate that I've had the opportunity to bring little lives into the world and hopefully can continue to have good health for many years and help other people that are going through their journey too. And thank you, Dr. Matthew, for your time. Thank you. It's great. Thank you both.